Hi, today we're going to be learning about ratios and rates. We're going to start off by looking at ratios. When we are comparing quantities of the same kind, then we can compare them using ratios. Uh, so if you have two or more quantities that are uh, distances or that are time or that are capacities or that are the same kinds of things like animals or balls or something like that then you can use a ratio to compare those quantities so we're going to start off by looking at an example of just showing how to write a ratio so in this example it says that there are five red balls and eight blue balls in a bag and we need to express this as a ratio so I'm going to start off by writing 5 for the red balls, then I'm going to write a colon, and then I write 8 for the blue balls. And what this and the way we say this is 5 to 8. So we say that the, the ratio of the red balls to blue balls in the bag is 5 to 8. Okay, so that is how you write a ratio. So now I'm going to give you a few examples that you're going to do yourself, and I'm going to give you uh, two minutes to work on this just so you can practice writing these ratios. Okay, you should be done with that. So let's quickly go through all of those. So for A, it said that you had, there are 15 girls and 14 boys in the class, and we need to express that as a ratio. So we have 15 for the girls, 2, 14 for the boys, and that is what your ratio should look like for A. Then we've got B, where we have two cats and one dog. So we're going to write 2 for the cats, and one for the dog. So that is what your ratio should look like for B. Then we have C, where we have 12 pencils and five pens in the pencil case. So we're going to write 12 for the pencils to five for the pens. And then the last one, D, we have seven roses and 11 daisies in a vase. So that is seven to 11. So that is what your ratio should look like for all of those examples. Okay, now we are going to go on to the units of measurement that are used in ratios. Now we've already said that you have to have the same kind of quantity when you are working with ratios, but sometimes you can have the same kind of quantity and have different units of measurement. So you might have met meters and kilometers, or you might have uh, grams and kilograms or something like that. They're still the same kind of measurement. It's still either distance or weight, or you could have minutes and seconds and hours for time. But when you're working with a ratio, you can make a ratio 
with those. But if you actually want to use that ratio to do calculations and things, then you have to make sure that your ratio is in the same unit of measurement. So that is what we're going to be doing now. We're going to practice. I've got an example here where we need to write as a ratio three kilometers to 23 meters. So I'm going to start off by writing three kilometers to 23 meters. And now we have to make those measurements the same. Now, I always recommend changing to the smaller unit of measurement. So in this case, that's meters, because otherwise you're going to end up having fractions and decimals and it just gets a bit messy. So it's easier to rather change to the smaller unit of measurement because then you're going to be multiplying by something rather than by rather than dividing. So over here, I'm going to change the kilometers to meters by multiplying to go from kilometers to meters we multiply by 1,000, okay? So over here, the three, meter, three kilometers is the same as 3,000 meters to 23 meters. Now, because I've got the same unit of measurement, I now don't need to write the unit of measurement. Over here, I had to write it because if the numbers are just written there without, <clears throat> sorry, without a unit of measurement, the assumption is that the units are the same. But if they're not the same, then we have to actually indicate what those units of measurement are. So over here, I now don't need to write the unit of measurement because they are the same as each other. Okay, so now I'm going to give you some time to do some examples for yourself. Over here, we have got four questions, and I'm going to let you do each of them separately with one minute for each question. Okay, so here's, let me start that again. Here's the first question. Okay, you should be done with that. So now let's go through that example. So for question A, we have five minutes to 23 seconds. Okay, now, as I said before, we're going to convert the, the larger unit of measurement, which is minutes, to the smaller unit of measurement. So we're going to change minutes to seconds. And to do that, we're going to multiply by 60. Okay, so I'm going to say five times 60, and that gives me 300 to 23. So that is what you should have got for this ratio. Right, let's go to question B. And again, you're going to have one minute to do it. Okay, you should be done with that. So let's go through question B. So in question B, you have two cups to 59 milliliters.
Okay, and I did give you the information in case you don't know that one cup is the same as 250 milliliters. So to convert from cups to milliliters, we have to multiply by 250. Okay, so now over here I've got two cups. So I'm going to multiply two by 250, that gives me 500 milliliters, and that is to 59 milliliters. So my ratio is 500 to 59. Right, now you're going to do question C, again with one minute. Okay, you should be done with that. So let's go through question C. So you've been given 4 kilograms to 63 grams. Okay, so to convert from kilograms to grams, we have to multiply by 1,000. So that gives us 4,000 to 63. So that is what you should have got for C. And now you're going to do the last one. Question D. Okay, you should be done with that, so let's go through that last one. So question D, you have 6 meters to 729 millimeters. Okay, so to go from meters to millimeters, we also need to multiply by 1000. So over here, 6 meters is the same as 6000 millimeters. So we have 6000 to 72 and that's what you should have got for question D. Okay, so now we know about what ratios are, how they get written and the fact that they need to be in the same unit of measurement for us to actually work with it. The next thing that I need to um, go through with you is simplifying ratios. So ratios are actually very similar to fractions. You are able to simplify ratios in the same way as you can with fractions. So with fractions, you are able to take the numerator and the denominator, and if they have a common factor, then you can divide by that common factor, and you keep on dividing until you can't anymore. So you could divide straight away by the highest common factor, and then you wouldn't have to divide more than once. But even if you don't manage to do the highest common factor straight away, then you just keep on dividing, both of them by the same thing until you can't anymore and you simplify it like that. It works the same with ratios. Okay, so let's do an example where we're going to simplify a ratio. So in this example, there are 360 red balls and 240 blue balls in a bag. We need to express this as a ratio in its simplest form. Okay, so we've got 360. to 240. Okay, now 
The first thing we can do straight away, just like we would do if we had a fraction, 360 to 200, over 240, is we would be able to divide by 10 and cancel out those zeros. We can do the same thing over here. So we can also divide by 10, and that'll give us 36 to 24. Once we've done that, we can also then divide by 12. Both of them are divisible by 12, so they, I can divide, divide this by 12, and that gives me 3 to 2. I could have straight away, right from the start, divided by the highest common factor, which was 120. But if you don't know what the highest common factor is, you can do it in more than one step like we did over here. Okay, so that is how you're going to simplify your ratio. You take the top, I mean, not the top, the left and the right, or if there's more than one, more than two things in your ratio, because you can have more than two things in your ratio, you divide each of them by the same value. So in this case, we divide it by 10, and then we divide it by 12, not 120. We divide it by 12, and that gave us 3 to 2, which we then can't simplify any further. Okay, so now I'm going to give you some to do by yourself. Okay, so over here you've got uh, these examples where you are going to take each of the examples you've been given, you need to interpret them and then simplify the ratios. I'm going to let you do each of them separately, and you're going to have one minute for each question. Okay, you should be done with that. So let's go through question A. So in question A, they tell you that you, there are 18 people in the class that prefer cats and 24 in the people in the class prefer dogs. So we're going to write that as a ratio. So we have 18 to 24. And then we're going to simplify. Now 18 and 24 both have a factor of 6. So if I divide by 6, I will get 3. And I divide 24 by 6 and I get 4. And now this can't be simplified any further, so that is what your ratio should look like when it is in simplest form. You should get 3 to 4. Okay, so now you're going to do question B. Okay, you should be done with that one by now, so let's go through that question. So we've got for B, when making a cup of juice, you mix 50 milliliters of concentrate with 200 milliliters of water. So we're going to have 50 to 200. Now they are both already in the same unit of measurement, so we don't need to do any conversions for this question. We can just go straight ahead and simplify. So we have 50 to 200. Now both of those are divisible by 50. So if I divide 50 by 50, it gets we get 1. And if I divide 200 by 50, I get 
4. So you should get the ratio of 1 to 4. Okay, now you're going to do question C. Okay, you should be done with that. So question C. In a typical day at school, you spend six hours in class and 45 minutes at break. So we have six hours to 45 minutes. Now, those are not obviously the same units of measurement. So the first thing we have to do is convert the hours to minutes. So to go from hours to minutes, we are going to multiply by 60. So 6 times 60 gives us 360 to 45. Okay, so now we've got the same unit of measurement. Now we can go ahead and simplify it. Okay, so both of those are divisible by 45. If you divide 360 by 45, you get 8. Now you may have done this in more than one step and that's fine. 45 divided by itself is obviously 1. Okay, so if you had more than one step getting to 8 to 1, that's fine, so long as you got to 8 to 1, that's what matters. Okay, and then the last question, question D. Okay, so let's go through that. For question D, we have one kilogram of food for our pets altogether. The cat eats 400 grams and the dog eats the rest. So the first thing we need to do is work out how much the dog actually eats because we can't make a ratio if we don't have both, both values. Okay, so we need to make uh, find out what the dog eats. So the dog eats one kilogram of food minus 400 grams. So now obviously, just like with ratios, we need to have the same unit of measurement because we can't work, we don't, can't, can't do calculations without, with different units of measurement. So I need to first convert the kilograms to grams by multiplying by 1,000. So that's 1,000 minus 400, and that gives me 600 grams. So the, I now know that the dog eats 600 grams of the food. So now I can go and make a ratio. I can say that the dog eats, let's do the cat first, the cat eats 400 to the dog's 600. And now we can go and simplify that. Okay, so both of those are divisible by 200. If I divide 400 by 200, I get 2. And if I divide 600 by 200, I get 3. So that is what my ratio should look like for what the, the cat eats to what the dog eats. Okay, so now we know how to do uh, simplifying of ratios. 
The next thing we're going to look at is increasing and decreasing in a ratio. Now, something that you can do is if you are given a quantity, you can increase or decrease that quantity in a particular ratio. So you can increase it in the ratio of two, 1 to 2, or you can decrease it in a ratio of 1 to 2 as well. So that is what we're going to learn how to do now. The first example we're going to look at is this one over here. We're going to be doing both increasing and decreasing of the number 20 in the ratio 4 to 5. Okay, so first of all for increasing. When we increase, increase obviously means to make bigger, okay? So in order to increase something, I need to be doing something that will actually make it bigger. So I've got the number 20 and I need to increase this in the ratio 4 to 5. So what I'm going to do is I need to divide by one of those numbers in the ratio and multiply by the other one. But I need to do it the correct numbers uh, that will actually make it increase. So in order to make it increase, I need to make sure that I am multiplying by the bigger number. So I'm going to divide by the smaller number, which is 4, and then multiply by the bigger number, which is 5. So in this case, I have 20 divided by 4, which is 5, times 5, which is 25. So when you are increasing, you divide by the smaller number, and you multiply by the bigger number in your ratio. So that's how you're going to increase a number in a ratio. You divide by the smaller number in the ratio and you multiply by the bigger number in the ratio. Then we're going to decrease. Now the same numbers, the same ratio, but this time we're decreasing. And obviously decreasing is the opposite of increasing. Decreasing means to make smaller. So now what we need to do is the opposite. We need to make sure that we are going to end up with a smaller number. So we need to be div dividing by the bigger number and multiplying by the smaller number. So I'm going to have 20 divided by the bigger number, which is 5, and then times by the smaller number, which is 4. So that gives me 20 divided by 5 is 4 times 4. I didn't actually need to show that step. And that gives me 16. Okay, so for decreasing, what we do is we divide by the bigger number, and then we multiply by the smaller number. And that will end up making it smaller, which is what we need when we are decreasing. Okay, so now I'm going to give you some time to do a few yourself. You're going to work on all four of these at the same or in one go. And I'm going to give you two minutes to do these questions.
Okay, so you should be finished with that question now. So let's go through each of those. So for A, you had to increase 60 in the ratio 2 to 3. So we take 60 and we are going to divide, because we're increasing, we're going to divide by the smaller number, which is 2, and we're going to multiply by the bigger number, which is 3. And that gives you 60 divided by 2 is 30 times 3 is 90. Okay, so for question B, this time we are decreasing 90 in the ratio 3 to 5. So when we're decreasing, we're going to divide by the bigger number. So I'm going to divide by 5 and then multiply by the smaller number, which is 3. 90 divided by 5 is 18 times 3 is 54. Then for question C, we have 80, which we are going to increase in the ratio 5 to 8. So because we're increasing, we need to divide by the smaller number, which is 5, times the bigger number, which is 8. Okay, so 80 divided by 5 is 16, multiplied by 8, and that gives you 128. Now for these questions, you can use your calculator. So long as you are showing what your calculations are, you can use the calculator to work that out. You don't have to do that in your head. Okay, question D, we have got 70, which we need to decrease in the ratio 7 to 10. So because we're decreasing, we're going to divide by the bigger number. So that's dividing by 10. And we're going to multiply by the smaller number, which is 7. So 70 divided by 10 is 7, times 7 is 49. Okay, so that's what you should have got for each of those questions. Okay, so now that we have learned about increasing and decreasing, we're now going to go on to solving problems using ratios. Okay, so you can get word problems and things that require ratios to actually solve, and that's what we're going to be looking at now. So let's have a look at the first example. I'm going to make it big so you can see it properly. Okay, let's just have that. There are 200 students in the grade altogether. The girls and boys are divided in a ratio of 11 to 9. Determine how many boys and girls there are in the grade. So here we have been given a total amount and we've been told what the ratio is, but we haven't been told how many girls and how many boys. We need to work out how many girls and how many boys there are. So we have to go and use the ratio to work that out. So let's get started with that. Okay, so first of all, we have, I'm just going to write my ratio first, okay? So my ratio is 11 to 9. So in other words, for every 11 students that are girls, nine of them are boys. Okay, normally when the ratio is given to you in a question like this, if they say 11 to 9, it's the first number will be for the first thing that they mentioned. So they mentioned girls first, so the first number would be girls. And they mentioned boys second, so the second number would be boys. Okay, so the 11 is for the girls and the 9 is for the boys. Okay, so now we're going to use that to work out how many girls there actually are and how many boys there actually are. In order to do that, we have to first find our ratio total. That is done by taking both of the numbers or all of the numbers that are in your ratio and adding them together. So we have 11 plus 9 and that gives us a total of 20. So what this is telling me is that out of every 20 students, 11 of them will be girls and 9 of them will be boys. Okay, so if I now know how many students I have all together and I can work out how many 20s there are in that, I can then use that to work out how many are girls and how many are boys. So I'm going to now go ahead and do that. So I'm going to start off by looking at the girls. So for the girls, I'm going to start off by saying that I need to take my total number of students because that is the only number of students that I actually know. So I take the total number of students and I'm going to divide that by the ratio total. So it's the total divided by the ratio total. Okay, so I'm dividing by 20. So that'll tell me how many 20s there are in 
the number of students that there are. And then I can use that to work out how many of them are girls because I know that for every 20 students there are, 11 of them are girls. Okay, you can't see that. So therefore, every 20 students that there are, 11 of them are girls. Okay, so now this is going to tell me how many 20s there are. And we're going to multiply that by 11 to find out how many of the students altogether are girls. So that gives me 200 divided by 20 is 10 times 11 is 110 girls. Okay, so what I did here, I took the total number that I had been given and I divided by the ratio total and then I multiplied by the part of the ratio that was for what I'm working out. So I'm looking at girls, so I multiplied by the part of the ratio that was for girls. So that was the 11 over there. Now we're going to do the same thing but for the boys. Okay, again we take the total number of students and we divide it by the ratio total and then we're going to multiply by the part of the ratio that is for the boys, which in this case is 9. So we multiply that by 9. And now I can work out what that is. So 200 divided by 20 is 10 times 9 is 90 boys. I could also have taken the 200 and subtracted the 110 and that would have given me 90. Okay, so that is how you use a ratio to work out how many of each item in the ratio there are when you've been given the total altogether. Okay, so now we're going to do, you're going to do a couple of your uh, examples yourself. Okay, so over here, you've got two questions. You're going to do the first one first. I'm going to give you for this example, three minutes. Okay, hopefully you are done with that question. 
So in this example, we have John, Paul and Ben that play marbles together. They decide to divide their marbles between them in the same ratio as the number of games they win. John wins five times, Paul wins three times and Ben wins four times. If they have 180 marbles all together, how many marbles will they each get when they finish playing? Okay, so the first thing we need to do is write down our ratio. Our ratio in this case is 5 for John to 3 for Paul to 4 for Ben. Now, as I said, you can have a ratio with more than two parts to it like this. Okay, so in this case, we've got three. There are three people. Okay, so that's what our ratio is. So now we also need to do our ratio total by adding each of those up. So we have five plus three plus four, and that gives us 12. Okay, so now we know what our ratio total is. Now we can go and use that to work out how many marbles each of them is going to get after they finish playing. So first we'll do John. Okay, so John is going to get five out of every 12 marbles. Okay, so if they have 180 marbles, that's the total number of marbles, we divide that by the ratio total, which is 12. And then we multiply by John's part of the ratio, which was five. Okay, so now I have 180 divided by 12 times five, and that gives me 75. So John gets 75 marbles. Now let's do Paul. So we're going to do the same thing. We also start with 180, we divide it by the ratio total, which is 12, because this is the total number of marbles, so we're dividing by the ratio total. And then we're going to multiply by Paul's part of the ratio, which in this case is 3. So I'm going to times that by 3. And then we're going to see what we get. So we have 180 divided by 12 times 3 this time, and I'm going to get 45. marbles. So that is how many marbles Paul will get. And the last one is Ben. Okay, now I could, because I've already worked out John and Paul, I could subtract their amounts from the total, but I'm going to do it the same way as I did it for this. So I'm going to say 180 divided by 12, and then I'm going to multiply by Ben's part of the ratio, which is 4. So over here, it's the same, except that that changes to a 4, and that gives me 60. Now, I want you please to take note that in both of these questions over here, these are word problems where you have been given context. So what you need to do is you need to make sure that your answers are answering the question. So in this case, the question was, how many marbles will they each get? So I need to answer the question and say that John will get 75 marbles, and Paul will get 45 marbles, and Ben will get 60 marbles. In this question, it was how many girls and boys? So it was 110 girls and 90 boys. I have to make sure that my answers are actually answering the questions that have been asked and not just random numbers. They need to be giving the context that was given to me in the first place. Okay, so that's question A. Now you're going to do question B. For question B, I'm going to give you two minutes to work on it.
Okay, you should hopefully be done with that one by now, so let's go through that question. So in this question, you have got Jenny, who is 12 years old, and she has twin sisters who are both 14 years old. They divide 200 sweets in the same ratio as their ages. So how many sweets will Jenny get? Okay, so first of all, let's write our ratio. So we have Jenny's age, which is 12, to 14, and another 14, because she has obviously two twin sisters and they both have the same age. Okay, so now if you look at this, you can actually simplify this ratio. So this, if we divide all of those by two, we get six to seven to seven. Now, technically you could do it without simplifying the ratio. It just means that you're going to be working with bigger numbers. Okay, which isn't a, a, a major issue. You can still get the right answer. It just means that you have bigger numbers to deal with. Okay. So now I'm going to go and work out my ratio total. Which is 6 plus 7 plus 7. And that gives you 20. Okay. So now I don't have to work out all three of them. How much they each get. I only have to work out how much Jenny gets. So I'm going to say Jenny. And to work her amount of sweets out, I'm going to take the total number of sweets, which is 200, divide it by the ratio total. So remember, we're dividing the total amount by the ratio total, which gives us 20. And then I'm going to multiply by Jenny's part of the ratio. Now, I have to do the 6. I can't do 12 because when I got the ratio total, I was using the simplified numbers. So I have to use the simplified numbers here as well. So I'm going to use 6 over here, so I'm going to multiply by 6. So that's 200 divided by 20 times 6. So 200 divided by 20 is 10 times 6 is 60. So that means that Jenny gets 60 sweets. Okay, so that's what you should have got for question B. Okay, now we're going to go and do another example. I'm going to put that up for you to see better. Okay, so in this example, we have a packet of sweets was divided between Sipo, Tembi, and Vusi in the ratio 5 to 2 to 3. If Sipo got 15 sweets, how many sweets did Tembi and Vusi each get? How many sweets were in the packet all together? Okay, so in this case, it's different because here we have been given not the total. We've been given the amount that one person from that ratio has. We've been told how many Sipo has. Okay, so now we're going to have to behave a little bit differently in our calculation, although it, it is going to be largely the same as what we did in the previous examples, the same concept. Okay, so over here, I've got my ratio, which is 5 to 2 to 3, and I'm going to work out my ratio total. which is 5 plus 2 plus 3, and that gives me 10. Okay, so now, Sipo has got 15 sweets. Okay, that I know now because they told me. So I don't have to do any working out to get that answer over there. Sipo, I know, has got 15 sweets. Now I need to work out how many sweets Tembi has and how many sweets Vusi has. So for Tembi, I'm going to take Sipo's amount, the only amount of sweets that I actually know, which is 15, and I'm going to divide it. But now in the previous example over here, where I was saying the total, I was dividing the total amount of sweets by the ratio total. So now I don't have the total amount of sweets. So I'm not going to divide by the ratio total. What I have is Sipo's amount of sweets. So I'm going to divide by Sipo's part of the ratio. So in the ratio, this was Sipo over here. This was Tembi and this was Vusi. Okay, so Sipo's part of the ratio was five. So I'm going to take 
the 15 and divide by sepals part of the ratio, which is 5. And then I'm going to multiply by 10 B's part of the ratio, which is what I now want to find out. I want to find out how much 10 B gets, which is multiplying by 2. Okay, so now I'm going to have 15 divided by 5 is 3, times that by 2, and that gives me 6 sweets. So 10B gets 6 sweets. Now we're going to do the same thing for Vusi. Okay, so for Vusi, again we're going to take Sipo's number of sweets, which is 15, and divide it by Sipo's part of the ratio, which was 5 over there. And then I'm going to multiply it by Vusi's part of the ratio, which is 3. So I take 15 divided by 5, and this time I'm multiplying by 3 for Vusi. And then I'm going to simplify that. So 15 divided by 5 is 3, times 3 is 9 sweets. So that is how many sweets Vusi is going to get. So now I've answered the first part of the question, which is how many each of them gets. Now the second part of the question is how many sweets were there in the packet altogether. So to work out how many there were all together, I can either just add all the different amounts. I can add sepal sweets, which is 15, plus 10 bees, which is 6, plus vusis, which is 9. So I can say 15 plus 6 plus 9. I can do this because I do know what they all have. Okay, I know all the different values. So 15 plus 6 plus 9 actually gives me 30. But if I didn't know what that, what all of these numbers were, if I hadn't had to work it out, if all I was asked was how many was in, this, in the packet altogether, and I hadn't been asked to work out how many Tembi had and how many Vusi had, then I wouldn't have these numbers to add. So what I would then do is I would work it out using sepals in the same sort of way as I did for Tembi and Vusi. So I could also do it this way. Take Sepal's amount, which is 15, and just like I did when I was working out for Tembi and Vusi, I'm going to divide 15 by Sepal's part of the ratio, which was 5. So divide that by 5, and then because I want to work out the total, I'm now going to multiply by the ratio total, which we worked out was over here, we worked out the ratio total, that was 10 over there. So I'm going to multiply by 10. So I get 15 divided by 5 is 3 times 10 is 30, which is the same answer as I got over there because it's just another way of getting to the same thing. Okay, so that is how you can use a ratio where you have been given the amount that one part has and then you can use it to work out the total or you can use it to work out the other parts as well. Okay, so now I'm going to give you a couple of examples that you're going to do yourself or an example rather, with a few different parts to the question. Okay, so in this question, you've got a rugby game that's happening with um, the HSHS school team that scored points in three different ways. Those ways were made up of tries, which are worth five points each, conversions, which are worth two points each, and penalties, which are worth three points each. The number of tries, conversions, and penalties they scored can be expressed in the ratio 5 to 2 to 4. Okay, so if they scored 36 points from penalties alone, how many times did they score altogether? Now, this is with tries, conversions, and penalties combined. So it's not what the score is that they got altogether, it's how many times did they score. Okay, so I want you to do question A now first. And for this question, I'm going to give you three minutes.
Okay, you should hopefully be done with that question. So let's go through question A. So what we know already is that the ratio of the number of times that they scored tries, conversions, and penalties can be expressed as 5 to 2 to 4. So let's first just write down that ratio, which is 5 to 2 to 4. Okay, and this is tries to conversions to penalties, just so that I know what those all are. Okay, then I'm going to work out my ratio total because I am sure that I'm going to need it at some point. So I have 5 plus 2 plus 4 and that gives me 11. Okay, so now I have my ratio and I have my ratio total. Now the information that they have given me so far is that they scored 36 points from penalties. Okay, now be aware that the 36 points is not the number of penalties. That is what those penalties were worth, okay, in, in terms of actual points. So now I need to work out how many because this ratio over here is for the number of times that they got penalties or tries or conversions. So I need to work out how many penalties they got. So I'm going to say the points that they got from the penalties So the number of penalties is 36 divided by, now each penalty was worth 3 points, so I'm going to divide it by 3, and that will give me the number of penalties that they scored altogether. So that is 12 penalties. Okay, so now I know that they got 12 penalties. Now I can use that to work out the total number of times that they scored altogether. Okay, now I'm working out, I don't need to work out conversions, individually and I don't need to work out tries individually. I just need to work out the total number of times that they scored. So the times that they scored is going to be, first of all, I need to use the only number that I actually have, which is 12 in terms of a number of times of scoring. So that was 12. That is the number of times that penalties were scored. So I need to divide that by the penalties part of my ratio. So I'm going to divide it by 4. And now I want to know the total number of times that they scored. So I'm going to multiply by the ratio total over here. And that will give me 12 divided by 4 is 3 times 11 is 33 times. So they scored uh, 33 times altogether between the tries and the conversions and the penalties. We don't know how many of each of them there were, except we know that there are 12 penalties. But the rest of them, we don't know the distribution at this point of tries and conversions. But we do know that they scored 33 times altogether. So that was question A. Now you're going to do question B. So for question B, uh, let me just put this up here for you. It says, the opposing team scored 98 points. Calculate the HSHS team's final score to determine whether they won or lost. So I'm going to give you three minutes to work on this one now.
Okay, you should hopefully be finished with that. So let's go through question B. So we need to now determine what HSHS team's final score was in order to determine whether or not they won or lost by comparing it to the opposing team's score of 98 points. So what we need to do in order to work this out is we need to work out how many points they got from each of the different methods of scoring. So we already know that they got 36 points from penalties. Okay, so we know that already. Now we're going to work out how many points they got from tries. Okay, so in order to work out how many points they got from tries, I first need to work out how many tries they they got. Okay, so just like I did for the total number of times scored, I'm going to use the amount of penalties that they scored in order to work out, in this case, the number of tries that they got. So we're going to say we know that they had 12 penalties altogether, so 12 divided by the penalties part of the ratio, which was the 4, and then multiply. This time I want to work out how many tries they got, so I'm going to multiply by the, by the tries part of the ratio, so I'm going to times by 5. And that gives me 12 divided by 4 is 3 times 5 is 15. So now I know that they got 15 tries altogether. Now, I also know that each try was worth five points. So I can work out how many points they got from all the tries altogether by multiplying 15 by five. And that gives you 75 points altogether. And that is the points that they got from the tries. Now we're going to do the same thing to work out the number of points that they got from conversions. So for conversions, again, I'm going to take the 12 divided by 4. That's the 12 for the number of penalties that they scored, divided by 4, which is the, the penalty part of the ratio. And this time, I'm going to multiply by 2, which is the conversions part of the ratio. So over here, I've got 12 divided by 4 is 3 times 2 is 6. So now I know that they scored six conversions altogether. So now I can use that to work out how many points they got from the conversions. I know that each conversion was worth two points. So I'm going to multiply six by two, and that gives me 12 points. So now I know that we have 36 points from penalties, we have 75 points from tries, and we have 12 points from conversions. So I can use that now to work out what the total amount of points they have, which is the final score. Okay, so the HSHS final score is 36 plus 75 plus 12, and that gives you a total of 123 points. Now, because their total was higher than the 98 that the opposing team got, we can then say, therefore, HSHS1. Okay, so that was question B. Now you're going to do question C. Now for question C, what you need to do is express the points they scored from tries, conversions, and penalties as a ratio in its simplest form. For this one, I'm only going to give you one minute because you shouldn't need very long for it because you've already worked out the number of points that they got for each of those different uh, things, the tries, conversions, and penalties. So I'm going to give you one minute.
Okay, you should be done with that by now. So let's go through that final part of the question. So for question C, again, you had to express the points that they scored from tries, conversions, and penalties as a ratio in a simplest form. So first of all, tries. The points that they scored from tries, we worked out over here, and that was 75 points. So I'm going to write 75, 2, and then the points that they scored from conversions, which is what we worked out over here, so that is 12, 12, and then to the points that they scored from uh, penalties, which they told us was 36 points. So that is what our ratio should look like to start with, but we're not going to leave it like that. We are now going to simplify it, and to simplify it, we are going to divide all of those by the common factor, which in this case is 3. So I'm going to divide 75 by 3, and that gives me 25. I'm going to divide 12 by 3, and that gives me 4. And 36 divided by 3 is 12. And I can't simplify that any further, so that is what your ratio should look like in its simplest form. Okay, so that is question or activity 6. Now we're going to go on to... Hang on. Rates. Okay. Rates are similar to ratios, except that rates, we are working with quantities of different kinds. So you can be working with distance and time, and you'll be working out a rate at which something happens in terms of two different things. So it could be the rate at which you cover distance in terms of time, or it could be the rate um, at which you use something up, or it could be the no and with rates we normally use the term per, so we'll say kilometers per hour, or pages per book, or cookies per tray, something like that, okay? So with rates we are working with different quantities, different types of quantities, and we uh, write it as a rate. Okay, so let's look at an example. Our example is a car driving at a constant speed covers a distance of 300 kilometers in four hours. What is the rate or speed at which the car is driving? Okay, so we're going to do this example quickly. Okay, so first of all, the distance that they cover is 300. Now, normally when we are working with speed, we work in distance per time. So it's uh, that we're going to have the distance divided by the time. If you think about when you are looking at the speed limit and things like that on the road, it's quoted in kilometers per hour, right? So what that means is if you have it written as kilometers per hour, this is actually a division sign, okay? It's not just a random sign that they use, it actually does mean division, like it does in maths. So kilometers per hour is saying we are dividing the number of kilometers by the number of hours that it takes to go that distance. Okay, so in this case, we have 300 kilometers, and we are dividing it by 4, because that is the number of hours it takes to go 300 kilometers. And when we simplify this, that will tell us, we want to get it so that this is 1 hour. So that will tell us then how many kilometers we go in 1 hour, and that will then be our kilometers per hour ratio, our, uh, rate. So we're going to say 300 divided by 4, that gives you 75, and then you can say kilometers per hour. Okay, so that is how we work out and express a rate. We write, we take whatever the, so in this case, whatever the first thing is that we are going to say in our rate, in this case it's kilometers, we divide it by the other quantity, which in this case is hours, and then we simplify that and we write it as kilometers per hour or whatever it is for our the rate that we're working with. Okay, so now you're going to do a couple of examples yourself. Um, 
for this one, oh, let me just quickly, you have got an example where it's all about Sarah baking cookies. And you are going to be expressing a number of different quantities as rates over here. Okay, so what you're going to do is for each of these, it tells you what the rate is that you need to, to work out. I'm going to give you three minutes to do all of these together. Okay, you should hopefully be done with that by now. So let's go through each of those. So question A, first of all, the, the situation is you have Sarah baking a triple batch of cookies resulting in 180 cookies altogether. So question A says express the number of cookies per batch as a rate. So because it's a triple batch, there's obviously three batches. So we are going to work out the rate by saying if it's going to be cookies per batch, I need to take the number of cookies, which is 180, and divide it by the number of batches, which is three. So that is going to give me 60 cookies per batch. So that's what you had to do for question A. Question B, she has to use nine trays to bake all the cookies. Express the number of cookies per tray as a rate. So now we're doing cookies per tray. So I need to take the number of cookies, which is 180, and divide it by the number of trays, which is nine, and that gives you 20. So the, the rate is 20 cookies per tray. Okay, then for C, it says she uses six eggs altogether. Express the number of eggs per batch as a rate. 
So the number of eggs per batch is six eggs divided by three batches. So that means that she used two eggs per batch. Question D. It takes 135 minutes for all the cookies to bake in the oven. Express the time per tray as a rate. Okay, so we have 135 minutes. It's time per tray. So the time, 135, divided by the number of trays, which is 9. And that gives you 15 minutes per tray. And then question E, the last one. She divides the cookies into 15 boxes to sell. The mass of the cookies in each box is 240 grams. Express the mass per cookie as a rate. So this one's a little bit more complicated. We first need to work out um, how many cookies there are per box, okay? So we have 180 cookies divided by 15 boxes. This will help us to know how many cookies there are in, in each box because then we can work out if each box has a mass of 240 grams, we can then use that to work out how many cookies or what the mass, sorry, of each cookie is. So I'm going to say 180 divided by 15 is 12 cookies per box. And then if that box has a mass of 240 grams, we can divide it by the number of cookies in the box, which is 12, and that gives us 20 grams per cookie. So now we know that each cookie has a mass of 20 grams. Okay, so that is how you do those, act those uh, questions. The next thing we're going to go on to is converting rates. Similar to what we had to do for ratios, um, where with ratios we were converting to make sure that we had the same uh, unit of measurement. For rates, you also need to know how to do conversions, not necessarily in terms of getting the same unit of measurement, but sometimes you are required to give a rate in a particular unit of measurement. So we're going to do an example quickly. An athlete takes 15 seconds to run 100 meters. Determine his speed in kilometers per hour. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we are going to convert the time from seconds to hours. Okay, so my time is 15 seconds. Now to convert it to hours, what I need to do is divide it by 60. That will convert it to minutes. And then I'm going to divide it by 60 again, and that will convert it to hours. Okay, so that will give me 1 over 240, or just 1. Okay, it's actually easier to just write it as 1 over 240. So that's 1 over 240 hours. Now we are going to convert our distance from meters to kilometers. So we have, for our distance, 100 meters and to convert that to kilometers we are going to divide it by 1000 and that will give us 1 over 10 kilometers okay so now we've got our time and our distance in the right units of measurement for determining our speed in kilometers per hour okay so our speed In kilometers per hour, we're going to take the kilometers, the distance, and divide it by the hours. So that is going to be 1 over 10 divided by 1 over 240. Okay, now you should already know that when you are dividing fractions, you tip in times. So that is 1 over 10 multiplied by 240 over 1. Or you can just use your calculator to work this out as well, and you'll end up with getting a final answer of 24 kilometers per hour. So that is the speed that the athlete was running, um, 24 kilometers per hour. Okay, so now you are going to do a couple of examples yourself. Uh, for this 
over here you're going to have uh, two minutes for each example so for the first one let me just give that to you quickly and you have two minutes to do this Okay, you should be done with that example now, so let's go through it. So for question A, you've got a kettle which takes three minutes to heat 300 milliliters of water to boiling point, and we need to express this as a rate in liters per hour. So the first thing we need to do is convert our milliliters, that it, or we can convert our time, it doesn't matter which one we do first. So we can do our time, and that is three minutes which we are going to divide by 60 to convert minutes to hours so that will give me 1 over 20 hours okay then I'm also going to convert my volume we've been giving it in milliliters so 300 milliliters we're going to divide by 1000 to convert it to liters and that gives me three tenths of a liter okay now these ones you could have written as decimals um, it doesn't really matter which way you do it and then your rate is going to be we have to do it in liters per hour so we need the volume per time so we're going to divide the volume which is three tenths by the time which is one over twenty Okay, then we can tip and times that, 3 tenths times 20 over 1, and that should give you a final answer of 6 liters per hour. Okay, so that was question A. Now I'm going to give you 2 minutes to work on question B.
Okay, you should hopefully be done with that by now. So let's go through that. So for question B, you have got a builder is able to lay 432 bricks in a noun in a nine hour work day and we need to work out how many seconds it takes him to do each brick so the seconds per brick okay so what we're going to do first of all is convert our time from hours to seconds so we've got nine hours and to convert that to seconds we're going to multiply by 60 to get to minutes and then we multiply by 60 again to get to seconds and that gives you 32,400 seconds so now i know how many seconds it's going to take him to lay all the bricks so now i can work out my rate at which he lays the bricks so we know the bricks are 432 so our rate is going to be we're working out seconds per brick so we're going to take our time 32,400, and divide it by the number of bricks which is 432 and that should give you 75 seconds per brick Okay, so that is how you had to do question B. Right, so now we're going to go on to using rates to solve problems. Just like we used rates to solve ratios to solve problems, we can also use rates to solve problems as well. Okay, so let's do an example together. I'm just going to make this big so you can see it. And hide that. Okay, you need to write a 2000 word essay. If you are able to fit an average of 12 words on each line and there are 31 lines on each page, what is the minimum number of pages you should have available for your essay? Okay, so let's look at how to do this question. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is we need to work out how many words you write per line. Okay, so or write down the ratio or the rate of words per line. Okay, so that is, they told us that you write an average of 12 words on each line. So that's 12 words per line. That was basically given to you already. Okay, then you also need to work out if you are able to fit 12 words on each line, and you know that there are 31 lines on a page, you can then use that to work out how many words you can fit on a page. So the words per page... is going to be 12, because it's 12 per line, multiplied by the number of lines, which is 31, and that will give you 372 words per page. Okay, so now we know how many words you can fit on one page. Now we know that your essay has to be 2,000 words long. So in order to find out how many pages we need, we're going to take the number of words we have to do and or write and divide that by the total number of words we can fit on one page. So the whole essay is going to be 2000 words divided by 372 words per page and that will tell us how many pages we need for our whole essay. Okay, so if I say 2000 divided by 372 that gives me 5,376. Pages. Okay, now we obviously can't have 5,376 pages. So, what is the minimum number of pages that you should have for your essay? Therefore, you need five about five and a half pages. So five pages won't be enough. If you only have five pages, you won't be able to fit your essay on. So you need to have at least six pages. Available. Okay, because if you have less than six pages, if you only have five pages, you're going to have part of your essay that won't fit. So you need to have at least six pages available to write your essay on. Okay, now I'm going to give you time to work on an example yourself. So in this example, it's again uh, a bigger example with a number of different questions. So here you have got 
a situation where you've got builders who are having to lay bricks for a house and we are going to work out how long it's going to take them and so on. So you're going to start off by doing question A. So a team of three builders is able to lay 150 bricks in one hour. They are building a house that will take 54,000 bricks altogether. They work nine hours every day and they don't work on weekends, Saturdays and Sundays. How many weeks will it take them to finish laying all the bricks? Okay, so I'm going to give you three minutes to work on this. Okay, you should hopefully be done with that. So let's go through that part of the question. So the first thing we need to do in order to work out how many weeks it will take them to finish laying all the bricks is we need to work out how many bricks they can do per week and then use that to work out how many weeks it will take them to lay all the bricks. Okay, so first of all, what they have told us is that they are able to lay 150 bricks in one hour. So we have already got a rate of bricks per hour. And that is 150 bricks per hour. Okay, now we can use that to work out how many bricks they can lay per day because they've told us that they work nine hours every day. So bricks per day. If they do 150 bricks per hour and they work for nine hours, we can then multiply 150 by nine and that will give us the number of bricks they can lay in one day. So that gives us 1,350 bricks per day. Okay, so now we know how many they can lay in one day. Now that we can use that to work out how many bricks they can lay in one week.
They told us that they work every day except for the weekends, which are Saturdays and Sundays. So in other words, if there are seven days in a week and they don't work for two of those days, then they are working for five days. So if they lay 1,350 bricks per day, then in a week of five work days, they are going to lay five times that amount. So we're going to multiply 1,350 by five to work out how many they can lay in one week. And that gives you 6,750 bricks per week. So now we can use that to work out how many weeks it will take them to lay all the bricks. So now we can see all the bricks. If there are 54,000 bricks altogether, we can divide that by 6,750, which is how many they can lay in one week. And that'll tell us how many weeks it'll take them to lay all of the bricks. So if we divide it, we end up getting eight weeks. Okay, so that means it will take them eight weeks to lay all of those bricks. So now we're going to go on to question B. Okay, so question B says, one of the builders gets injured before coming into work on the first day. So now they're down from three builders to two builders. How long will it take the remaining two builders to finish the job? Okay, so now obviously, if the number of builders has decreased, then the length of time it will take them to do that work is going to increase. Now, I recommend using what we learned earlier about decreasing and increasing in ratios because the number of builders went from three to two, so it decreased in the ratio three to two, which means that the time that it's going to take to do the work is going to increase in that same ratio. So use that to help you to work this question out. I'm going to give you two minutes to do this question. Okay, you should hopefully, hopefully be done with that. So let's go through question B. So in question B, as I said already, we know that the workforce has decreased from three builders down to two builders. So the builders have decreased in the ratio three to two. They went from three down to two. Okay. Now that means that because there are fewer builders, it will now take longer to do the work. Okay. If each builder was able to do one third of the work, 
then now they're down by one third of the number of builders, which means it's going to take them extra time to do the work. So um, the time is going to increase and it's going to increase in the same ratio that the builders decreased. Okay, so now our time we already worked out over here was eight weeks. So now we're going to increase that time in the ratio three to two. So now we're using what we learned about ratios and we're applying it over here. So we learned that when we're increasing in a ratio, we take the amount that we have to increase, we divide by the smaller part of the ratio, which in this case is two, and we multiply by the larger part of the ratio, which is three, okay? So I'm going to work that out and that eight divided by two is four times three is 12. So now we know it's going to take us 12 weeks to do the work now that they are down from three boulders to two boulders. You can check all of that if you want to by working out if all three of them are able to do 150 bricks per hour, then two of them would only be able to do 100 bricks per hour and you'd be able to work the whole thing all out again. You would end up getting to 12 weeks. So you can check that if you want to. But the quicker way of doing it is to use the ratio idea that if the builders have decreased in this ratio, then the time will increase in the same ratio. OK, so you get 12 weeks for that one. Then question C. For this question, it says that you have not, they have now been given a deadline. They need to finish laying all the bricks in five weeks. Now, obviously, we just worked out that with one man down, and there's still a man down, they are going to take 12 weeks to do this job. So now we need to know how many extra builders do they need on the team to meet this deadline. So I'm going to give you three minutes to work this out.
Okay, hopefully you are done with that. So let's go through that question. Okay, so here, as we already said, they have now been given the deadline that they have to finish all of the bricklaying in five weeks. But now we've just worked out that because they are a man down, they're not even going to take eight weeks, they're now going to take 12 weeks. So we need to work out how many extra people they need in order to meet this new deadline. If everyone is able to work at the same rate that they originally, that the original three builders were able to work at. Okay, so first of all, our time, just like in the previous one where the builders decreased in a specific ratio, here our time has now decreased. We are sitting at 12 weeks for two builders, but our time has now decreased from 12 weeks down to five weeks. Okay, now because the time has decreased that they have available, they're going to need extra builders. So the builders are going to increase, the, the number of builders they need is going to increase in the same ratio. Okay, so the ratio is the same, but where the time was decreasing, the builders, the number of builders must increase because for less time, you need more builders to do the work if you want to complete the same amount of work in the, same, in the less time. Okay, so now we are going to take the number of builders that we have at the moment, which is 2, and we're going to increase it in the ratio of 12 to 5. So we're going to, because we're increasing, we're going to divide by the smaller number. So we're going to divide by 5 and multiply by the bigger number of 12. And that will give you 24 over 5 or 4 and 4 fifths. Or you could write it as 4,8 as well. Now obviously you can't get 4 fifths of a builder or 0.8 of a builder. That's not possible. So um, less than 4. 4,8 builders won't be able to finish the time, the work in time. So only four builders will not be able to finish the work in time. So we have to round up. Anytime you have a fraction of a person or something like that, you always have to round up. You can never round down. Okay, so in this case, we have a fraction of a person. We have to round up because we have to take that person into account. So therefore, we need five builders altogether. Now, they already have two builders on the team, which means that the extra builders that they need would be three. So they need three extra builders to join the team. And if they have three extra builders to join the team, they will then be able to finish the job on time. Okay, so that was a very long lesson all about working with ratios and rates. Now that we've learned the concepts in this lesson, it's important to practice, practice, practice. If you haven't already got the worksheet that goes with this video, you can find it by clicking on the link in the description below. The worksheet comes with an extra exercise full of questions for you to work on to master the concepts covered in this lesson. If you found this video helpful, please hit the like button so that others can benefit from it too. Also be sure to subscribe so that you can easily find my other lessons and hit the bell so that you will get notified about lessons as I upload them.